Okay, so welcome back to this second lecture where we're going to describe more machine learning methods for many body physics, quantum physics, classical physics. Um, so I didn't mention it but at the beginning, but my lecture notes will be available or are already available, I don't know, on the, on the, on the website of the ICTP. So I think that you can access them all if you are logged in or something, if you have, been, if you have attended this conference. And tomorrow I'm also going to give you some codes, computer codes, which will be public available. For example, to simulate some quantum systems using these ideas. Or you might want also to, to be here tomorrow morning just to have a look at that. So in the previous lecture we've seen uh, the role one of the paradigms of machine learning, which is this supervised learning. And we've seen some applications to, for example, classifying phases of matter. I've shown you before, right, this example here. Now, what I want to discuss is another paradigm, which is called unsupervised learning. So what is this unsupervised learning? It's, it's conceptually a bit harder than uh, the previous one. So the previous one, I've told you that it's basically just fitting. Uh, in this case, plus a clever method for optimizing. In this case, uh, unsupervised learning deals with this problem. So we, we have again a lot of data, my data set, like the one I wrote before. But I don't have the labels, so I don't know what the answer to my problem should be on those selected examples, right? So it's not like before that I already know, so I already know that uh, this phase uh, is, uh, is, uh, is disordered, the one on the left are ordered, or the one on the right are disordered. I don't know that in advance, so I want to find it by myself, in a sense. So this is much more powerful application, if you want, of artificial intelligence. So to do that, um, we need a couple of tools and conceptual and practical tools to realize this goal. So in particular, uh, this unsupervised learning can be used to find, uh, can be used to find the probability distribution according to which those samples are generated. So we assume that underlying these samples that I've been given by somebody, uh, there is some unknown probability distribution that I want to determine. So the goal of the supervised learning, unsupervised learning, is then to devise, to find, uh, for example, an artificial neural network that I call uh, F again, such that as much as possible, uh, So all, all of these are just high dimensional vectors, such that these two, this, this probability distribution is well approximated, and I will specify in what sense, by my neural network. So I imagine again that my high dimensional function, my artificial neural network depends on some parameters. And here I'm also uh, specifying a normalization. So this is a, a probability density. So I have to specify also uh, a normalization for this neural network. So in particular, if I want this to be a, a proper probability density, I have to divide everything by its uh, normalization, which is basically in this case just, uh, so imagine that x is just a, a discrete variable, so it would be the sum of uh, all possible values of x, of uh, f, of x, and p, right? just the normalization. Okay, so now, how can I do that? Well, to do that, 
first of all, like before, I have to define some function uh, which uh, measures how far we are from, uh, from the target probability distribution and how well we are approximating our, our data. So uh, it turns out that uh, we cannot use the, 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 the measure we were using before, which is L2, basically, distance simply because uh, we don't know uh, the value of p uh, of pi. We just know samples from, from, from pi. So we just want to use this information, not the value that pi takes on those points, because simply we cannot estimate and we don't know it in advance. So the quantity that he said is much more meaningful in this case is called the uh, cool back divergence. So I always cool back Liebler. So. divergence, which is a measure of how similar or how far two probability distributions are. So for example, imagine that my target distribution is this one and my approximate is this one. So then in this case, the, the, the kulmbach liebler leibler divergence is defined in this way. So it's, so basically it's uh, the probability of uh, of pi given uh, basically sort of distance between pi and, uh, and f, so my approximate, um, my approximate probability distribution, and it's defined uh, for a continuous, uh, for a discrete valued uh, function, like the one that I'm using here, like the sum over all the possible values of x of basically pi of x, so my unknown probability distribution, times the log of, uh, so my pi of x, so the exact probability distribution, divided by the approximate probability distribution, so in, which in this case is f of x and p, so divided by z of p, right? So I can put z of p here. Or z. Okay? So uh, there are two things that we should remark about this uh, cool back uh, Leibler divergence. So first of all, you see that uh, if uh, the, the target probability distribution, pi, is equal to the approximate probability distribution, okay, then this ratio is equal to one and the log of one is zero, so which means that this quantity has a minimum at zero. And the other thing is that it is not a proper distance in the, in the sense of the matrix. Uh, because if you invert the role of pi and f, you see that uh, this quantity changes, so it's not a proper matrix. But still, it has a, 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 quite, um, a right, um, a clear interpretation in terms of um, uh, information theory. In particular, it can be interpreted as the quantity of information that you miss when you represent your data with this approximate uh, probability distribution instead of the original probability distribution. So it's the extra, it's the information you are, you, are, you are missing in compressing, if you want, your data with another probability distribution. So we want to minimize this quantity and find the minimum which corresponds to the best possible approximation for my probability, right? So to do that, okay, I mean, it's, uh, we have to basically, so this quantity, this object depends on the param parameters of my neural network, so, um, and uh, this will also show you uh, why this, uh, this quantity is important, because if we do the derivative, for example, with respect to some uh, one of my parameters of this uh, uh, DKL, then you can see, I mean, uh, that this can be written uh, immediately. So you see, you find this. So the only thing that depends on, uh, on P here is F and Z, okay? So you have a first term, which is just uh, minus pi of X, then we have the, uh, okay, the, the, the derivative, pk of the, the log, basically, of f, x, and p. So this is the first term that is basically deriving this object here, the denominator. And then we have another term, which is plus, so, uh, the, so the derivative with respect to pk of the log of z of p, okay? But then, uh, I mean, we, we can rewrite this eventually just as the, the difference between two expectation values. So we have, the di so the first expectation value is with respect to this probability distribution pi, so you can already see it here. 
So it's the expectation value over pi of the derivative of log of f. So this is an expectation value over this probability distribution, pi of x, right? With a minus. And then I have a plus. So you can also do the derivative of this object. I mean, I'm not going to do it uh, uh, explicitly, but it's very easy. And, uh, but you can show that when you do this derivative, you find the, the basically the same object. So the, the derivative of the log of f again. But the average now is not done on pi, but on my approximate probability distribution. So it's done, if you want, on f over z. OK? So the, the gradient of this quantity has a very transparent uh, physical meaning, or I mean probabilistic meaning, in the sense that it is 0 only if the expectation value of these objects are equal on both distributions. So you attain a minimum when uh, you basically uh, have that those expectation values are, are equal. So for all, these, all those derivatives have the same expectation value. And it, it is also important, that it tells you why we choose this, uh, this, uh, this object in the first place. Because uh, as you can see, those expectation values, for example, uh, this one, so if we, if we rewrite it, it can be written like the sum over x, so all the possible values of x of pi x and this object, which typically I call the dk of x in p. OK, so this is this expectation value. So pi is already normalized. But this can be approximated like the sum over my samples, so the sum over i, if you want, to n s of this dk because of the law of the large numbers, so 1 over ns. So it's the simple average over my sample of xi. OK? So I take my, my samples, and I estimate this expectation value, again, as just the simple average of this object, which is a function I can compute very easily, on those samples. So this means that uh, never during my optimization, when I need the gradient, so I can use the gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent as before, I need to compute or to know the actual value of pi on those points. I just need the points themselves and to compute some averages over those points. Right? So the other ingredient that we need is this one. So this one, so this thing is really easily to compute. Once you know the, the, the artificial network, you just need to do the derivatives and compute them on some given points. So the, this other one is a bit more, it's a bit trickier, because you have to be uh, able to sample from your neural network. So these expectation values, in other words, would be, so, so the idea is that you generate some other samples. So like, let's call them, I don't know, x uh, prime of i x prime, so x prime of 1, x prime of 2, OK? So and these samples, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, high dimensional data are generated according with a probability which is given by the by the neural network probability, OK? So to, in order to compute those, uh, those, uh, those expectation values, and so to compute the simple average over these x primes, you need to be able to generate those points. So you need to be able to sample efficiently, if you want, from the, from the, from the machine. So in order to do so, uh, we need to introduce uh, some practical uh, scheme to do that. Uh, it turns out that uh, so the, the networks that I introduced before, so in particular this uh, uh, these deep networks, these feed-forward networks, are not particularly suitable for this purpose. And instead, I mean, there are others. Yes. Uh huh. No, I didn't. Yes, you are too far. <laughs> the first term here. Uh huh. Uh -huh. 
Yes. I don't have the probability pi, no, but I, I have the points which are distributed, and distributed according to pi. So which means that uh, computing expectation values over pi can be estimated averaging uh, the function I want to average over those points. So this is the law of large numbers, right? It's the principle also of Monte Carlo sampling. So I generate a lot of samples from a given distribution, and then I, I compute the, the value of, my, of, the, of the function I want to average over those, over those points. Huh? Yes, but I'm, I'm never using this distribution explicitly. I'm just using the points which are drawn implicitly from that distribution. So to compute this sum, I don't need pi. That's, that, that was my point before. To compute this sum, I don't need pi. I just need to, com to know the value of x. That's it. OK, so now let's introduce a, um, an architecture. So let's introduce like a, a network which allows me to, to, to use, to, to compute this quantity efficiently, to sample from this, uh, from this network efficiently. So uh, what I'm going to, to, to talk about are called the restricted Botsa machines. And these are somehow the, the, for many reasons, I believe these are the natural entry point in the world on neural, on neural networks if you come from the statistical physics or in general from physics. Because they have a strong connection, as you can imagine, from the name with, uh, with classical and uh, statistical thermodynamics. So what's the idea of these machines? So uh, I've told you before that uh, we need a high dimensional function, right? So we need an SM f of, uh, uh, so we, want, we have this f of x everywhere, so this high dimensional vector. So uh, let's assume for a moment that, uh, my, that my vector, so my x, takes the form of a spin variable. For example, you can imagine that you have a binary variable which can take values of zero and one, which can be mapped onto by itself, on, itself on, on a spin variable which can take values plus one and minus one, okay? So we recall these variables, uh, as you expect, sigma one, sigma two, sigma n. Okay, so again, sigma one, so this is my high dimensional vector, which, are, which I'm now taking in the form of a spin vector. So uh, each of those can take plus or minus one. So it's a spin one half, classical spin one half. Now, uh, the, the idea of this uh, RBM, so restricted Boltzmann machine, is to write this, uh, this uh, high dimensional function, so this network, if you want, as the partition function of a classical object. So in particular, it's written, so let me write it like that, as the sum of some, uh, over some uh, auxiliary spins, which are called hidden units, and I'm going to tell you more about this in a second, of uh, the, the Boltzmann weight, so the exponential of, uh, so we have in this, uh, in this uh, classical energy, some interaction term, which, which is equivalent to the, to the network terms I was discussing before, which, which, which drives an interaction between my spin and those uh, artificial spins, so hidden variables. So this is in exponential. So this is really just the, the classical interaction energy. Plus, then I, I also have some, uh, some bias terms for those spins. So both for the, for the, let's say, for the hidden spins, so these H variables, and uh, for, the, for the physical spins, okay? Let's say physical variables, sigma i, ai. So, so let's see uh, what does it mean. So in this function, so in this partition function, the para parameters to be determined are the following. So first of all, the, the interaction matrix, so these weights W, then these biases, and then this, this bias for the, these fields, if you want, for the classical, uh, for the spins, for the spin variables sigma. So in general, uh, what we do here is that we, uh, we take a fixed number of, uh, of uh, hidden variables. So for example, in this case, we take m hidden variables. So m hidden variables, so which are these hj's which take the value of plus or minus one, so they are themselves uh, spins. 
okay? Uh, and M is, a, is a also a, a, is also like a, a parameter that I can tune, right? Which in a sense corresponds to, uh, to how clever my network, how, how smart my brain, my artificial brain is. So you can imagine that the more of those artificial uh, neurons I have, the more complex my network will be because I will have more connections and uh, the more accurate uh, the approximations of, of the functions I want to determine will be. Right? So this is the basic idea. So there are also representation theorems for those, uh, for those uh, machines. Now, uh, so the, the, the idea now is that, so you can represent this graphically, where those are your, those, your sigma spins, so sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma four, for example. And then you have a couple of uh, hidden units. In this case, I have just two, so H1 and H2. And these hidden units, as you can see here, interact. So these are classical spins. They interact with all the, the physical spins in this way. Okay. So why are these machines called restricted Boltzmann machines? So they are called restricted because, as you can see, we don't have any direct interaction between the spins, you see? So the only interactions which are allowed are between the, the, the sigma and the h. We don't have direct connections between the, uh, the sigmas. And the, the reason why this is the case will be apparent in a moment. So indeed, since we don't have any interactions between the, the h, we can perform uh, explicitly this sum, okay? Because uh, you see, uh, we, we can basically factorize this object in the form of, uh, uh, so we can write it as, again, so the exponential of sigma, so the sum over i of sigma i a i, which is just a common factor, which does not depend on, uh, on h. And then we have the sum over all the possible values of h of uh, the, the product of j, where now j, again, is the, the index of the hidden unit of uh, the exponential uh, of the sum of i, w, i, j, so h uh, uh, sigma i, j, plus h, j, b, j. Okay? So I can do that, just a, a manipulation. And then uh, I can sum individually each h, j, because these are non-interacting. So it's basically, if you want, an infinite model in, this, uh, in those variables. So at the end, you can write explicitly this, uh, this function as, again, the exponential of this first object times the product. So here, for each hj, we have to sum the two possible values. So we have the exp of plus one and the exp of the same object with a man, minus. So at the end, we have the exp of something plus the exp minus that something, that, so that we get the twice the hyperbolic cosine of the argument. So basically, of sum over i um, of w i j sigma i plus uh, b j. Okay. So uh, we've been able to, to perform this summation, which is, which is in practice on the, on the inverse space of these variables, so it's exponential, analytically because of the structure of those connections. Now, uh, we have this, uh, this structure, so we know the, the explicit form for the, for the F, and we want to use it to sample from, uh, we, we want to use to generate uh, samples which are distributing according to this network. So how do we do that? So how many of you know about the Metropolis Hastings algorithm? Now let me ask again the question. How many of you know about the Metropolis method? Ah, okay, that's better. So uh, the idea is that we, so we have a probability distribution, a probability density at least, 
an, an unnormalized probability density which has an explicit form. Okay, this one. So in principle, what we can do is that we can devise a Markov chain. So I don't have, unfortunately, time to explain how this works in practice, but uh, let's assume that you know already what a Markov chain is and how it works. So, uh, which generates a chain of samples. So, for example, you, it's a stochastic process which starts, let's say, from a given uh, many-body configuration, so let's say S1, and then uh, transits to a sequence of, uh, of other configurations, sigma2, etc through some uh, transition probability. So I have a probability of going from this to the next element through a transition probability, which I call uh, capital T of, uh, let's say in this case would be of uh, sigma one of going to sigma two. So this is a stochastic process. So with some probability, so given sigma one, I will generate stochastically one possible sigma two with some probability, and then given sigma two, I will go on and uh, I will advance my Markov chain. So this will give a way to, uh, to generate my probability samples from my probability distribution, provided that I satisfy the so-called detailed balance condition, right? So this is what the, the, these Hastings, uh, um, Hastings Metropolis uh, approach uh, comes in. In particular, you can show that uh, you, you will sample, so th those, uh, those, uh, those configurations are distributed according to my original uh, uh, probability distribution. So let's say, let's call it pi of sigma. If uh, I accept my uh, full next configuration with a probability which is given by, so, so let's say the probability of of accepting my, uh, my configuration to be equal to the minimum of one and the value of my probability distribution over the new configuration. So here, this is the, accept of, uh, the probability of accepting a transition from sigma to sigma prime, okay? So we are here, we want to go there, for example. So this is equal to pi of sigma prime over pi of sigma times uh, this, this transition probability. So this, this, this transition probability, for example, of going from sigma prime to, to sigma, and that's a transition probability of going from sigma to sigma prime, okay? So this is the metropolis asking the criterion. So, um, so in practice, what you can do then to sample from this machine, so one simple uh, thing that you can do is that, for example, you, you have your co current configurations of spins, so n variables, which can take plus or minus one, you pick at random one of them, you, you flip it, and you compute that, that, that thing, that, that, that object on the new flipped configuration, compute this ratio, in that case the transition probability is symmetric, so you compute just the ratio of the two probabilities, and decide whether to accept or not this change in the, in the, in the configuration according to this probability, right? So you, may, you might have used this approach, for example, to sample from the classical partition function on the Ising model, right? That's something people see. Okay, so this is one possibility. The other possibility, which is, however, used a little bit, um, uh, is more popular in this field, at least in, uh, in this field of restricted Boltzmann machines, is not the Metropolis sampling, but the, 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 the Gibbs sampling. So Gibbs sampling is a different idea, as, which is particularly useful in, the, in this case. So the idea of the, of the Gibbs sampling is that uh, uh, instead of considering just a f uh, this probability distribution as a function of sigma, uh, and I assume now that uh, also these weights are just uh, real numbers, so that this object is just a probability distribution as it should be, and uh, uh, what I can do then is that uh, I, I define, so I, I, I want to sample from a space or a joint space. So if you want now my, my, my X, so my, my configurations that I want to sample now will be the ensemble of the sigma and of the H variables, right? So now I really have an ensemble of sigma and H variables that I want to sample from. And in particular, uh, this Gibbs sampling uh, does the following. So it takes as a transition probability, 
so, uh, so, so again, now the transition probability uh, needs to drive me uh, to, a, to a different configuration, X, X prime, where one, uh, where one of both uh, the configuration of sigma and h are changed. So typically we do this uh, in this way. So the first type of moves, the first type of sampling that we can do is where we only change, uh, uh, for example, sigma, and we left uh, uh, h unchanged. So this is one possibility. And the other set of moves that, that did we instead is that we fix, uh, uh, we fix, a, we fix uh, uh, sigma and we sample only h, okay? We change just h. So these are the two uh, possibilities that we can do. So in the first case, so in the case where we, we just sample uh, uh, sigma and fix h, we use the transition probability uh, basically, um, so the probability of, of going in this case, so, so max to x to x prime, we use uh, the probability of, uh, um, so this, uh, this basically F of uh, uh, sigma given H. Okay, so in this case, what I do is that uh, uh, I basically just, uh, so I use, sorry, so this is the probability of going, so sigma prime given H, uh, okay. So, which is defined basically as the, uh, so if we normalize everything correctly, this is just this divided by, uh, so this is just, so, okay. So this is the, so this is the definition of the, the probability of sigma prime given H, which if we write it, if we do this thing uh, in the explicit, if we write this thing explicitly, just F of sigma prime and H, so the quantity that I've written uh, over there, divided by the sum of uh, over sigma prime, so over all the possible sigma prime of h, okay? So uh, the whole point of this is that uh, in, uh, in this case, you can compute exactly this, uh, this, uh, this quantity for, the, for this restricted Boltzmann machine architecture. And you can do this sampling using uh, basically uh, this, uh, this, uh, this transition probability. So the big advantage of this Gibbs sampling strategy is that uh, at the end, uh, you don't have uh, a, to, to perform an extra um, acceptance step as you have in the, in the metropolis sampling, but you accept all the moves you are generating. So this is the, the great advantage. So let me, let me, so you can find all the details in the notes, so I, now I don't want to go too much into the details, but the idea is the following, uh, I mean, graphically. So you have your set of, uh, of spin variables and you have your set of hidden units, okay? So what you do is uh, that, uh, for example, in the first step, you fix the hidden unit, so you don't change them, and you sample, so you generate values for those, using this probability, which, which you can determine and easily compute. So you freeze those and you update at once all the spins that you have down here. So it's like a multi-spin move, so it's very particularly relatively efficient. And then you have another move where you, 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 you froze the hidden and you sample the, the spins. And you go back and forth sampling from this machine in this way. So once you've done that, you can also, you can also measure then the second term that we had in, uh, in, the, in the KL divergence which was this difference, which was this uh, expectation value over the, my approximate probability distribution, so over my neural network, which in this case is this restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay, so you are not obliged to do this. I mean, you can just do Metropolis if you like, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the historical reason is that because uh, people wanted to, to, to give sampling. So if you, don't, if you have a different architecture where, for example, you have interactions here, you cannot do give sampling. But you can still do Metropolis, yes. Uh, the, the important thing, however, is that uh, you, you do not want to have interactions between the hidden units. If you have interactions between the hidden units, then you cannot uh, trace them out as I do here analytically. 
Right? So this is the, the only constraint, the important constraint. Okay, so now I have all this uh, uh, nice stuff. I know how to sample from my machine. I know, for example, uh, how, to, how to compute also those, uh, those quantities that entered before. So for example, I mean, I told you that I needed to compute this D of K, which are basically the, the derivative with respect to my parameters of the log of my function, okay? Which in this case depends on sigma. So also in this case, we can compute that, for example, I mean, just let me write down, down something. So for example, if you derive with respect to the, this uh, visible bias, so this is just uh, sigma i, so just, it is very easy. If you derive with respect to the weights, w, i, and j, then this is just equal to the hyperbolic tangent of uh, the sum of uh, the sum of uh, uh, j. Sigma i j, basically w j. Sorry, sigma, so the sum of i. And I mean, and et cetera. So you can determine, uh, I mean, you can just do the derivatives of that quantity with respect to, so the log of that quantity with respect to all my parameters and derive analytically all these quantities, okay? Um, okay, uh, so I can then use all this machinery. I can implement it also, if I like, to, uh, to compute the second term that I had in the, in the, in the, in the kudlach leibler divergence. So I remind you that so the, de the derivatives of the gradient of this uh, KL divergence was given by, again, so the expectation value of this D of K of X, so again, X of P over my approximate uh, uh, FRBM minus the same expectation value of the same object. So again, for example, the spin or this other quantity over the true probability distribution. Okay? And again, I can use my Markov chain, so the sample that I've generated from my RBM to estimate this expectation value as a simple average over those samples, right? So again, as before, I can use the stochastic that you send to, to perform the optimization of this object. And here it is even more uh, interesting, I believe, because um, what people do is that, again, they define a number of, uh, of, uh, of elements in my, in my uh, batch. So, so I take a smaller element than the total number of samples, again, for example, to compute this expectation value over p, over pi. And uh, typically, one takes this, the same number of, uh, of elements to sample from this object. So I generate the same number of, of, uh, of points distributed according to, to my uh, approximate probability distribution, also to estimate this difference, okay? And uh, uh, one of the most remarkable things is that this approach is particularly effective uh, for NB as small as one <laughs> or two, right? So you can, this means that uh, you can just take at random one or two samples and estimate the gradient uh, in, in a way which still will, will drive you towards the minimum of the function. So this approach, which is, uh, which is extremely noisy in practice, in theory, but in practice works very well, is known as uh, contrastive divergence. So the fact that you take NB1, for example, you have a strongly biased estimate of the gradient. But still, this, uh, this estimate will drive you, will allow you to converge uh, relatively uh, quickly to, to, the, to the ground state, so to the minimum of this scale divergence. Okay, so at the end of everything, then you have obtained the, the best parameters you have in your network to estimate this unknown probability distribution. So the question is, is this useful to do something, uh, for example, in physics or in other, in other fields? So, uh, of course, yes, it is extremely useful. 
For example, you can use it to forge handwriting, right? So this is an application which is quite fun. So let's imagine that my data set is, uh, the is a lot of things that I've written, right? For example, I've written a lot of text, and my X is the things that I've written. So again, the images on my head writing on a lot of text. So here, for example, there we have uh, three examples of things that three different people have written. And you, you can imagine that for each people, we have a collection of, uh, of letters, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, written papers that uh, each of those people have written. So this is my large data set, okay? And you can imagine that, for example, uh, each of those correspond, each of those person has a different pi, right? So for example, I have a certain probability of writing the four in a way that I, I normally do. I, I do not always write it like that. I can, sometimes I write it like that or like that, but so there's a probability for me to write a certain letter in a certain way, right? And this probability, of course, is a mess. We don't know it in advance. We, we, cannot, we can only estimate it through those techniques, for example. So what you can do then is that you learn this probability, which is crazy, and uh, you, can, uh, you can write whatever you like. Just, you, you can have this person write, for example, that is giving a lecture in Trieste today, but probably they don't even know where Trieste is. Uh, and, or you can, you can write that they owe, they owe you a lot of money and uh, this kind of stuff. So it's also potentially dangerous. You have to be careful. And you can go, for example, on this website where they show you other interactive examples of where you can write your own text and it will be generated in, the, in that writing style. This is a general application. The other application is, for example, um, if we want to learn the thermodynamics. So uh, let's do this uh, again. Uh, um. <clears throat> this is application to physics again. So I, I always switch back and forth from, uh, let's say, more fancy, useless applications like writing things to more physical applications. Uh, so in this case, so let's assume, for example, that you have a classical system of which uh, you can measure, for example, some, uh, from which you can uh, measure the, um, for example, the spin configurations. So you have a, a classical system of spins, and you can observe the configuration of those, sp those spins as a function of time if you, have a, if you are in a lab, right? So I have my two-dimensional or n-dimensional model of classical spins. And I can observe a lot of those snapshots. Okay, so each of those again is my data set. Okay, so we know from uh, Boltzmann that those distribution, those uh, things are distributing, distributed according to the exponential, basically, of minus beta, the energy, oh, sorry, of this x, right? Divided, again, by some normalization. However, you can imagine that, I mean, you are in a lab, but you don't know what the energy is, so you want to find the energy. So you want to find what, somehow, what is the energy that describes this experiment. So the, what you can do, then, is that you just do unsupervised learning. So you take those samples, you use your Boltzmann machine, your model, to reconstruct this probability, unknown probability distribution, and from that, you can read, basically, or you can compute the energy on an arbitrary configuration that you have not found in the, in the experiment, okay? So this is the idea of reconstructing thermodynamics, if you want, from the lab. So now, the question that you might ask is, okay, but what kind of interactions can I describe with my RBM, for example, which is a very simple machine. I mean, you don't even have interactions within the spins. How can you think that you can describe complex things, complex interactions? Well, it turns out that, I mean, I can give you a theorem that uh, uh, any classical, any physical classical model uh, which has uh, k, uh, k body interactions where k is uh, like one, two, three, can be described efficiently by a Boltzmann machine. By efficiently, I mean with a number of parameters, so with a number of hidden units, which scales basically only polynomially with the size of the, of the system, so with the number of spins. So to give, to give you roughly an idea of this, for example, imagine that you wanted to describe 
um, a term, an interaction term. So I told you that at the beginning we don't have any interactions between the spins, sigma one and sigma two, for example. But imagine that for some reason in my Hamiltonian I have an interaction of this form. So sigma one, sigma two so times some interaction. So how can I describe this in the form of a Boltzmann machine? So now we are talking about the representability of those interactions, right? So the idea is that we can mediate this interaction through the addition of, of an extra hidden unit. So this is also a very nice interpretation, if you want, of these extra hidden units. And this, this hidden unit can be used a little bit a la Hubbard Stratonovich, if you know. So we can, when we can insert an auxiliary hidden unit, so just one, which mediates this interaction. So we do this, and we say that this is equal to a Boltzmann machine where we have an interaction between this spin sigma one and this hidden unit V with some term W one V, and then I have also another term which is sigma two H V W two V. Okay? Then this H can take just plus or minus, I can sum it again using the hyperbolic cosine and all of that. And basically you, you can find, uh, uh, so using the two possible values of, of sigma one and sigma two, so in total we have four possibilities, you can just fix, you can solve this system of equations if you want for the unknowns W1 and W2. So there is a solution and you can mediate exactly this interaction using this extra hidden unit. So this is the idea also of this hidden unit, that they mediate correlations, they mediate interactions in the physical uh, spins. So, uh, and in particular, so this tells you that, for example, if you have this, the, the, the short range rising model, you have to put a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, hidden units, which is equal to the number of bonds, so the number of interactions that you have in the, yes. In, the, in, your, in your problem, which in this case would be order n, so the number of spins. Okay, so, and this is what it has been shown in this paper, so they showed that reconstructing, the, the, for example, the thermodynamics of the, of the ASIM model, when you put the number of hidden units, with, which in here is called ms, equal to the number of spins, you basically manage to reconstruct all thermodynamic quantities in an efficient way. So they showed this also from numerics. So let me just mention very quickly our uh, last uh, application, which is to quantum physics. And which, which I mean, you can, you can in principle do this the same reasoning, but in the quantum case. So in the quantum case, of course, uh, you don't want to determine the energy because you don't have uh, a classical energy. But you want, what you want to determine is the, the wave function, if, for example, of the system. So you can imagine that now I have quantum spins, I'm in a lab, or I have uh, cold atoms, if you want, and I'm doing a measurement of the density of these uh, the cold atoms of my quantum spins. So uh, when I do a measurement in, the, in my system, you know that uh, what, what I will get from, for example, from these images that come from actual experiments in cold atoms, so each of those points are just single atomic uh, densities, basically. What I get is that I get psi square. So the, those points, so those spins values, if you want, are distributing according to the square models of the probability by uh, the, 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 me the, the measurement process in quantum mechanics. So what we, what we showed is that uh, we can use our uh, machinery to train a network to learn psi square, basically, in some given basis, okay? So once you can learn efficiently on very large system also this probability, you can use this machine then to, for example, reconstruct some observables that you were not able to measure directly in the experiment. So in a sense, what we can do is that we forge some quantum measurements that have never been performed in the experiment. So we use the information we get from the experiment, or we use the wave function we reconstruct from the experiment to measure other things. For example, we can measure the entanglement entropy or other things that are very hard to measure in an actual experiment. So in this paper, we have shown that we can perform uh, effectively an, uh, one uh, in silico reconstruction of the Rényi entropy or other quantities. And uh, the, the idea, of course, is that uh, it's not sufficient also to, to learn just one basis, but if you want to reconstruct the, the, the phase, you also have to uh, look at different bases, but this is a technical uh, detail if you want. Okay, so this is uh, the first application to quantum physics that I will discuss, and tomorrow morning I will discuss a lot more. So uh, thank you, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.